morning, everyone. Um, I would like to welcome you all at the first panel of today's conference, which is titled Transforming Conflict Through Mediation. So mediation is going to be the major main topic that the speakers of this panel are going to tackle. Uh, my name is Teresa Jermanova. I am an uh, assistant professor at the uh, Department of Middle Eastern Studies at the Charles University in Prague, in Czech Republic. And I'm also an analyst uh, or a research fellow with Association for International Affairs, also focusing on the Middle East, and I'm going to chair today's panel. Uh, so let me first say before I introduce uh, our speakers today uh, what we are going to talk about. So what is interesting about this panel really that, well, that we have interesting speakers of course, uh, but what is interesting about them is that they're coming from variety of different fields. They're coming from academia, from diplomacy, and they are practitioners and some of them actually match these different roles. Uh, so what they however do have in common is interest and thorough insight into issues linked to mediation and also personal experience uh, with mediation or with advising uh, mediators or governments. Uh, this is exciting really because they're because they're coming from different fields and they focus on different countries and different situations, uh, what we're going to see is our different perspectives linked to mediation and different types of conflicts or situations uh, where mediation can be used. Um, and that should also allow us for an interesting discussion towards the end uh, of different issues that mediators have to tackle and also uh, about how to preempt conflict. Uh, so, without further ado, let me introduce our speakers. I'll go by the order uh, in which they will speak. So, the first speaker on the panel is uh, Jaroslav Franz. Jaroslav Franz, uh, who is assistant professor at the Faculty of Theology at the Palatsky University uh, in Czech Republic. Uh, he focuses on interfaith dialogue. Uh, and especially uh, focusing on relationships between Christianity and Islam. Uh, and he will also share his own experience uh, with the issue of moderation. Uh, then further to my right uh, is uh, the second speaker, May uh, Tamimova, who is a researcher at the Lebanese Center for Policy uh, Studies in Beirut. Uh, currently also a doctoral candidate uh, in anthropology at the University of Oxford. Uh, and she focuses on politics of urban and civil violence and reintegration of schemes of, for people um, affected by conflict, but also uh, former uh, militants. Uh, then to my left uh, is the third speaker uh, of the panel, Lenka. Aldov, who is a diplomat at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Czech Republic. Uh, she will focus on gender aspects of mediation, um, and she is uh, also a focal or Czech focal point uh, for uh, women, peace, and security. Um, then, further towards my left, uh, Annette Weber, uh, who is a senior fellow focusing on Middle East and North Africa. Uh, she's a senior fellow with the German Institute uh, for International and Security Affairs, the SWP. Um, and she focuses on regional uh, and intrastate conflicts, especially in the Horn of Africa. And she will talk today also about Sudan, or especially about Sudan. Uh, and she also focuses on state building and in fragile states. She has been advising uh, German foreign ministry uh, on issues uh, linked to mediation. So without more introduction, I would like to pass uh, the, the floor to the first speaker, Jaroslav Franz. Thank you.
So good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your invitation. It's a great honor to be here today. Actually, it's my first time at this department, at this ministry, so it's, thank you very much for your invitation. Uh, uh, well, since early morning, lecture by lecture, or step by step, I have realized I'm not worthy to be here because there was open a lot of noble and highly profiled uh, topics. Uh, I'm not going to speak about so highly noble uh, theme. I would like to share with you a couple of uh, short remarks, more humble re remarks about our internal agenda at the Faculty of Theology, because I'm a Roman Catholic theologian. That's my uh, profession. Uh, I'm, beside that, I'm also, so thank you very much for your uh, introduction. I'm also a researcher. I'm, I'm an expert, let us say, on a field of interreligious and intercultural dialogue. So, uh, so I would like to speak about uh, our theological faculty, uh, which is quite old one. It's, uh, it was established more than 440 years ago in eastern part of the Czech Republic, Moravia. And it survived a lot of uh, historical shifts and uh, even uh, political changes. Uh, and since the beginning of the 21st century, for the first time in the history of this faculty, we don't have just a study program for a theologians, but we have also another branches of studies. One of them is a charity and social work, and part of it is also a humanitarian or development studies. And uh, part of the curricula, studying curricula of our students from that field of research or study uh, is an obligatory a whole semester, it means at least a three or six months, uh, uh, extra, external training uh, that takes place abroad, uh, actually in different countries around the world. So some of our students spent uh, three months in India, for instance, supporting Kathkari uh, people in central India. Uh, the Kathkari of today are uh, fragmented and very uh, scattered community, highly dependent on uh, others for their livelihood and for the place to live. They are actually landless workers, and many of them have become bonded laborers working on uh, brick kilns or workshops. Uh, some of them spend a whole semester in Africa, for instance, uh, uh, in Uganda, teaching local children and supporting local farmers uh, by uh, microcredits which is a special, uh, it's an extension of a very small loans, micro loans to uh, borrowers. Uh, some of them uh, even spend a couple of months in uh, South America, uh, supporting migrants uh, heading to north, it means to the United States, to the United States, and so on, so on. And a lot of them also spend a three or more months uh, uh, in uh, Muslim countries. Well, uh, so nowadays you can find our students, our, our uh, uh, former students, uh, our alumni, uh, or absolvents uh, in different countries, uh, even in Haiti, which country was devastated by earthquakes uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, so you can find them also in the Middle East countries. Well, and during the studies, and especially before the training, this external training abroad, they are usually strongly motivated because they were born in Europe and they have some self-consciousness. They were born in, a, in a Europe. So they are strongly motivated to fulfill their duties, uh, to fulfill their tasks in the best way. Um, and they are in general way uh, very, at very young age. I'm not an ageist, but uh, they are very young because they are students. And then generally face a lot of conflicts in those uh, foreign countries. Mainly, or most of them might be described as a culturally based conflicts or religiously based conflicts. Well, and to avoid these conflicts or to help them uh, cope with uh, those conflicts, uh, there are also obligatory courses for them uh, set up to improve their uh, cultural sensitivity or their uh, communication skills. 
And the integral part of this studying curricula is also a supervision. It's called, I think the correct word is a clinical supervision, but I'm a little bit scared to, to use the word clinical, so let's call it just a supervision. Uh, uh, that is run by a school. It was uh, a school action, oh, a university. Yeah, and the supervision is based on a formative, mainly on a formative, and partly on a restorative elements of the relationship between the supervisor and the supervisee. So it's performed in small groups of students. That is an obligatory part. Individual supervisions uh, or supervision is simply uh, proposed to them, so they have a chance to choose it, but it's not an obligatory part of the curricula. So they have to take part on this supervision. The team of supervisors consists of two experts. Uh, one of them is, an, uh, is a psychologist, uh, usually an expert on a crisis intervention. And the second one is, because we are faculty of theology, is a theologian. And he's an expert on uh, cultural and religious or spiritual dialogue. Well, uh, the first level of uh, the supervision uh, takes place uh, prior to their uh, departure and the second one immediately after they return back to the Czech Republic. And this is the crucial point of their study, because they are those who should be those the strong party in the conflict, those who are, uh, who, are, who are able to take a correct decision, who should settle down those conflicts. And because John Paul II, the uh, former uh, pope of the Catholic Church, said that youth is our future. They are among us. And if we speak about what we should do today, or what we have done already, we have to speak about also youth, because they are right now here in present time, and they will be there in a couple of years, when we will be already somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, so I won't be, I, won't, I don't won't bore you uh, uh, by describing our methods or means of uh, supervision. However, I would like to present aims of the supervision. What is the crucial point or main uh, point of, uh, of the supervision? So, so our faculty is called the Faculty of Theology, and it means Christian one and Catholic one. Our students are approximately half and half Christian believers, and approximately, second half, also a so-called secular students or secular citizens of the Czech Republic. Because based on our last census that, uh, from 2011, Czech Republic is the most secular country uh, in uh, probably in the world, maybe in, the, in Europe, at least in Europe. Yeah. So when saying secular, you can uh, substitute this word by uh, non-believers, agnostics, uh, simply those do not affiliate themselves uh, with a religious doctrine, religious tradition, community or church. And um, this is the uh, part, the core of my speech. For this reason, when dealing with those secular students, that's the way I would like to call them, uh, and they uh, stay abroad, the practical training, uh, there usually appears a conflict when they meet a culture based on a religious values or religious doctrine. And uh, since our youth, our students uh, in Czech Republic uh, have been tending to be, let's say, a liberal, because our society is trying, is tending to be a liberal, uh, they are ready to tolerate a whole set of different cultural values. Uh, they are really, really tolerating people, unless there is a conflict within some popular ideologies, like a uh, woman ideologies in, in uh, Europe, like women rights, children rights, gender affiliated issues, and so on. And in that moment of rising conflict, they start to throw into question their own set of values, one, uh, one by one, one values by one, uh, on one hand, and their loyalty to an organization they are affiliated to, on the other hand. So they, they have a conflict, they have an internal conflict. What's the best way I should behave in those foreign countries while dealing with the cultural conflicts? Should I follow my own liberal approach, or should I be uh, more uh, loyal to my, uh, uh, to my uh, new company or a new institution? That, that's the point. Um, yeah, 
to give you an example, when I have been speaking about India, uh, in Czech Republic it's not allowed to slap a children uh, in the face. It's the physical punishment. But in India, for instance, when while dealing with uh, youth, with the children, they are usually uh, teachers or uh, they are taking care about infants. Uh, it's a standard procedure to apply uh, physical punishment even in some Christian communities, some Christian uh, uh, companies yeah, or NGOs. Well, another conflict usually appears in the moment when the set of their values or on liberal values uh, or based on liberal values, uh, let me use this adjective just, uh, uh, on a social consensus, based on a social consensus, meets uh, a set of values, the way or religious, very strong uh, argumented, and even untouchable arguments. So that's, that's a very crucial point for them. When their liberal uh, approach, based on a consensus, meets uh, untouchable arguments, mainly a religious one. Usually a role uh, of a woman or position of a woman within a society. And the aim of our supervision is to help them formulate and even write down, and I would like to underline that phrase, to write down their own structure of their personal values. And beside that, their own personal system of orientation within the jungle, jungle of world spread values, because it's a very common word nowadays. In other words, we ask them a question, is there an untouchable axis uh, or place you can stand on uh, within the structure of your values? So that, that's the question we ask them. And when, de when dealing with the Christian believers, students, the aim of the supervision is nearly the same. However, there is a relevant distinction. Uh, we ask them a different question. If a certain student is a believer, uh, then his relig religiously based set of values and maybe untouchable set of values uh, might be in a conflict with another religious based set of values. And uh, I can give you an example. When we had a student in, in Malta, uh, she was a Pentecostal uh, Christian believer and she had a serious problem. She, had a, she was in a conflict and she was, while he, she was uh, obliged to teach refugees about so-called European concept of marriage, including the concept of uh, the same-sex marriages. And she, she felt a strange feeling about that uh, task because she was not in harmony with uh, that set of value or this value uh, she should uh, teach uh, the refugees. So she started discussion and this simple internal conflict within her personality started a conflict within the whole community of those refugees because she was not strong enough to deal with this question. Well, so I'm going to conclude my, uh, my uh, address. Uh, we are trying to encourage them to be culturally strong, not to be just liberal or relativistic. We are calling them to be a culturally strong or strongly culturally rooted within their own, uh, their own uh, self-understanding and understanding of the culture or system of values. Because we teach them, when you are strong enough, you are not a rigid person, but you are the one, on the contrary, you are the one who is open to calmly dispute almost everything. So we do not recommend them to accept our own theological or philosophical correct answers, already formulated answers. So we just present them the questions, we present them the tasks, and above all, we show them a supporters, supporters uh, that boldly call themselves uh, supervisors or experts. So we are those who are following their own path to the set of values. So the conclusion is, uh, the cultural conflicts or religious conflicts are not only those visible dramas or those uh, external conflicts among, or fates or uh, fights or hate speeches uh, and so on among nations, communities or uh, religious communities and many other uh, international uh, communities. It's uh, above all and first of all a personal disharmony so there we have to f search for a root of each conflict. 
is there a certain personal disharmony within those who are involved in a conflict? So as far as we are able to separate those uh, involved in a conflict, for instance, if there is a war or fight, we can even expel those fighters from a community. It's also possible uh, to separate someone from his own internal or personal fights is much harder task to do. But still, we believe that it's possible to fulfill these tasks, and that's what we are working on during the supervisions. Of course, beside that, we have a lot of different uh, projects that deal with uh, publications, conferences, uh, and many others. But I have chosen this one, this very small and humble piece of our agenda, this internal agenda at the Faculty of Theology, because I think it's very important in nowadays, when almost everyone who is involved in an intercultural or interreligious dialogue, almost everyone knows what we should do. But the question in nowadays, in, at the beginning of 21st century, is what we have already done. Thank you very much for your attention, and thank you, uh, thank you very much once again for the invitation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for an, for an inspiring talk. What I learned from it myself is um, that making students, but not only students, but perhaps on an everyday basis making ourselves aware of the personal, cultural, religious or ideological, like liberal values that we, that we all possess somehow and learning to navigate the conflictual space on every ba of, on everyday basis might help us to learn to tackle small conflicts and maybe bigger conflicts as well. Uh, so thank you so much for an inspiring talk on that. And I would like to pass the floor to uh, May Tamimova. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Thank you for being here and thank you for an interesting talk. It's good to balance the overall macro uh, dialogue and peace building with a very kind of personal approach to it. So my intervention here is to maybe bridge between these two. And since I come from a background of anthropology, it's a huge passion of mine. So today I'm going to be framing the issue of mediation across two themes. But as you will see, they really uh, go with each other. So I'm using the case of Lebanon, which is a place that I've studied uh, for several years and also grew up in. So in Lebanon, there's an ongoing case of political violence, and it's due to a variety of factors. But what I will be mentioning in my presentation is how our power sharing um, system of mediating conflict has resulted in the ongoing political violence we have today. So also from that, when we are dealing with a state that is so fractured and fragmented, I would also like to pose the question of, in such circumstances, how do we mediate on the ground today as well? So in my presentation, I really put into question the whole issue of power sharing, which, um, I mean, for the general public, it's, it's a mediation strategy, usually post-conflict, where uh, in a political arrangement, you have uh, groups from antagonistic sides just joining in a political arrangement. So scholars over the years have been very critical of this uh, mode of mediation. It translates on the ground, usually in short-term political pacts. It's not very, uh, it doesn't have a very long-term plan ahead of it. And um, it also really entrenches ethnic, linguistic, sectarian lines, which becomes the way that you identify to a state, which is the case in Lebanon that I'm presenting. So in Lebanon, power sharing uh, is called confessionalism because power is shared across different sects. And when I was researching how to how to show what power sharing means visually. I was trying to find infographics that showed how our politics work, our government. But actually, I found this picture really helpful because from, um, from uh, right, right, you have our head, uh, our um, 
you have our Prime Minister, then you have our Speaker of Parliament and our President. So power is really divided across these three institutions in government and they're from three different sects. So I really loved this picture because this was after electing, um, after, the, after Michel Aoun, who was our president, was elected. And it was a period of immense political stress. Um, but here are, they are, you know, sharing chewing gum. And at first they're all very serious and then Saad al-Hariri gives it to Nabih Birri and then Nabih gives it to Michel Aoun and then all of them are kind of satisfied. So I just found that, you know, a nice way of showing how power sharing more or less works. Now on a more serious note, um, these three individuals also had political parties and some of them, not going to name, uh, have also been part of a sectarian civil war that we had in the country for 15 years, from 1975 to 1990. Now, um, I would like to say that due to power sharing in Lebanon, and confessionalism, this has resulted in immense corruption, basically the collapse of the state and its resources. Everything has been pulled out of the state, privatized by companies led by these politicians. And there's, ha, there has been a real rise of informal economies that feed on clientelism and nepotism that results from these arrangements. So on a superficial level, power sharing as a mediation did end the Lebanese civil war, as it was also an arrangement that was put since the 40s and even before that. So on a superficial, you did end civil strife, but what happened was you had these same individuals sucked into government, and in a way, political violence continues, but through different channels. So I'm framing how mediation works in such a context. And so the objective of my input is, how do you mediate when you have such a state? And if the state is non-existent, what is the role of civil society? What is the role of international leaders and international organizations? And what are their success stories as well? Because I also want to paint a brighter picture. And also, how do we go from here? How can we also ensure a more homegrown process of mediation when we have a lot of civil society that is externally funded. The Lebanese government is not invested in mediating conflict, either because there's no leverage to do so, there's severe mistrust in state institutions, specifically the army in some communities, or simply because it is not beneficial to the political economy that kind of feeds on these kind of arrangements. So, however, in critical times, in the last few years, Lebanon was rocked with the Syrian crisis next door, in critical times, the Lebanese army does step in and th there's an extensive military intelligence network and they do mediate conflict on the ground. Over the years, they've become more visible. There was, there's been the implementation of several security plans. So as now a Lebanese citizen, um, having the army around you, having checkpoints, having officers on the streets, it's a part of your daily life. It's part of your visual landscape on a daily basis. So. In several communities across Lebanon, the presence of the army causes alarm. And this is because these communities have been severely, um, severely marginalized by the state for decades. So some of the field work that I have done on this topic actually showed that even when the army comes into these communi communities on a peaceful basis, either to extend social or health services, what happens is that these communities are just so not used to seeing representation of state that they act to act against it in an aggressive way. Now, um, but on general, um, the army is something that is respected, but of course there have been a lot of clashes in several areas, and this is also something that I'm gonna show here. So, because I do not like stigmatizing uh, Palestinian camps or border areas or places where there are refugees. I'm not going to say where these things are, but here's basically a map um, by Lebanon Support, which is a great NGO, and they work on mapping conflicts across Lebanon. They're going to expand this to the Middle East soon. So basically you use filters, and I just used armed conflict, community clashes, and suicide bombs because I felt that that kind of represents what I'm trying to say here most about political violence. 
So when we think about mediation, we cannot only think of the state in this case. When you're dealing with communities that have, marginalized, that have been marginalized by the state for so long, you cannot just say that the state is going to come and mediate conflict. And also, that it is impossible to do so. So what we need to start thinking about is who are people on the ground who have either political, social, religious um, um, capital on the ground in their, very, in their very small communities and territories to actually act as mediators. So the importance of local mediators comes into play here. And there have been very successful projects with people like sheikhs, but even more extremely people who are even leaning to political jihad in some of these locations, who were part of mediation processes. Now, what is most important to note about these mediation processes is that the Lebanese army cannot name these people as terrorists, even though they are working with them on the ground. And this is also comes out of a work of other anthropologists that work specifically in Palestinian uh, camps, which is not only Palestinian, it's also Palestinian, Syrian, and Lebanese inhabitants live there. But there have been successful mediation between groups in the camps and the Lebanese army without the Lebanese army even entering the camp. But because of the use of local mediators, what they can do, what they have managed to done, is that they have managed to broker agreements between different armed groups. They managed to convince certain individuals with warrants of arrest to surrender to the Lebanese state, and this was all in the sake of protecting their communities and preserving peace without having the army enter and interfere. Also, this was a very useful strategy because without having the heavy force of the army or the presence of the Lebanese state, they actually minimized retaliation. So the way the state and international uh, actors have um, acted in these locales have really encouraged these local mediators to form their own power within these communities. And it's not only Lebanese, but also, for example, a lot of international organizations working on Syrians, they resort to a very interesting character, who is the shawish, or the gatekeeper, or the, basically the one who is in charge of Syrian camps. So this is someone who has close ties to the military, and is Syrian, of course, but also within that, they start rising in their own ranks, in their own communities, with more social and political capital. So what happens is that by use of these local mediators, what actually happens is that you are creating a new form of political leadership. And what eventually happens over the years, which is something that I'm trying to research in my doctorate, is that these local mediators, when they reach to a point of having enough political uh, capital, how do they really enter into politics? So what is that process of induction? And a lot of these mediators actually made it big. A lot of them enter and leave political groups, and they start, framing, they start forming their own kind of culture of, of uh, also clientelism in, it, in, in its own sense. So how effective is this kind of mediation in a general culture that encourages clientelism, that encourages this kind of um, division of power? So now, on a more optimistic note, I would like to um, share some success stories that have been done not by the Lebanese government, but by international actors, and also some really hard-working civil society in Lebanon that works on processes of peace building and mediation. So, um, yes. So before going into civil society, there is also one note that I need to mention is that the CIMIC, which is a civil, uh, civil military co cooperation um, project that's been going on for several years, has really been bridging the, gap, the gaps between the military and the communities that have been really underserved by the state the most. So these kind of programs focused on gender sensitivity, ways of dignified arrest, and also um, having a more peaceful transition of power in certain areas. So CIMIC has been a real success story for Lebanon. It has really attracted so many donors. There are many governments supporting the CIMIC process. But then again, is this really a homegrown process? Not really. When these funds, um, when these funds end, what is going to happen to the CIMIC? Of course, there have been some uh, success stories. But again, we need to think of the long term. Now, on a less serious note, um, 
what is really, what is really beneficial in mediating conflict. So I'm, I just put here a few um, examples. So there's this NGO that I really thought I should share with you. It's called Fighters for Peace, and this is led by militants who are part of the Lebanese Civil War. These are people who have a lot of blood on their hands, and they decided to form an NGO with each other. It's an NGO filled with people from different uh, political backgrounds. So you have uh, basically the founders is one from the right-wing Christian party, and another one from the Lebanese Communist Party, who during the war were really, were very bloody battles. So I just, I'm not going to open these things, but um, Basically, you have live testimonies of people expressing regret, people expressing what they should have done differently when they were younger. So these, for example, are fighters who are active in the Lebanese Civil War. Okay, this is taking time to open, but even what I found really interesting was um, You can even meet the ex-fighters, and you can even book your own dialogue session with one of them if you want something more personal and individual. So these are specifically aimed at people who maybe were leaning towards violence or have committed violence and do not know how to deal with these kind of issues themselves. This is a very good framework for them to resort to when there's no national-led process of peace building and mediation. So a few others, um, we have Umam for documentation and research, it's basically what stands in the place or what replaces uh, the state's archives for the Lebanese Civil War because there's no narrative on that, so Umam is also working on that. And this is the work of March. They basically, um, and these are very important projects who really impacted hundreds of lives. So March, for example, uh, were leading a play called Romeo and, Ju uh, sorry, love and war on the rooftops, and it was basically trying to bridge two communities. One of them are Alawit, supporters of al-Assad supporting Alawit communities, and other ones are Sunni, kind of also an area where there were a lot of um, Islamist groups operating, and there, were, there was a lot of civil strife between them. So what this NGO made them do is basically reenact a play, and this was widely attended, and what it actually did, it brought, these are men who are actually fighting in the streets against each other, and there is blood between them. And here they are sitting and acting in a play, and also switching roles between different parts of the play. So these are the real community-based interventions that are helping people seriously mediate conflict. Um, other, other kinds of more serious mediation strategies is basically this. I don't know why the map came out that way, but I couldn't do anything about it. This is also a location sh showing mass grave sites in Lebanon. These are grave sites that have been formed in the Lebanese Civil War. And it is a project by the ICRC, International Council for the Red Cross, Committee for the Red Cross. And what happened basically was that it was met with so much resistance from the Lebanese government. The Lebanese government did not want to take part in these excavations because who are responsible for these mass graves? They're basically people who are still sitting in parliament. So they do not want to give the green sign for that. So anyway, these are just a few initiatives by international bodies that are really helping to alleviate pain and suffering, which is something that the Lebanese government is not really interested in doing. So this brings me to my last small bit of the presentation, is how do you really start the process of mediation when you do not have a government really supporting that? And when you have a lot of civil society organizations that are funded by donors who you know, come and go, but, but what really is homegrown in this? Civil society is active, but when we look at results, we had elections in Lebanon after 
since 2009. We had our first elections this year out of hundreds of candidates who came from civil society, which was a very great turnout, basically, for, for these civil society actors who have been campaigning for years before elections. Only one made it to parliament. And uh, she's a member of parliament who has really close connections to, to the... Um, to, the, to the leading government, actually. So in light of all that I discussed, how can we envision mediation? How can we envision peace building when you have all of these factors working against you? When you have a country that, is really, that, that really relies on external funds and donations as well, how do you make people believe that they are the owners of these mediation strategies? So these are just the, the questions that I'd like to uh, post to you today and also to think about myself. And yes, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, now the next speaker is Lenka Aldorf from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me start by a rather interesting summarization of a relationship between conflict um, and peace that I've recently heard uh, in the UN Security Council. And I was told that peace is not an absence of conflict, but rather an active process leading up to the culture of peace. And in my opinion, mediation is an integral part of such process in all stages of the conflict, from prevention of the conflict to cessation of hostilities to signing a peace agreement and peace building and implementation of such agreements after that. Uh, today, I was asked here to speak uh, not only as a diplomat, but rather as an expert, and to elaborate on the gendered aspects of mediation and some of the current trends uh, within the United Nations. I would like to start by some rather disturbing statistics, um, because in a, if we are considering a gender-responsive third-party mediation, it needs to rest on three interlinked areas. Uh, which are actually being currently increasingly monitored by the UN. The first area uh, would be representation and participation. Unfortunately, between 1990 and 2017, uh, women consisted only 2% of mediators, 8% of negotiators, and 5% of witnesses in major peace processes. The second area that is crucial are substantive issues on the agenda and in the content of peace agreements. However, here the statistics is clear again, because in 2017, uh, only three out of 11 peace agreements uh, included gendered aspects. And third area uh, is institutional framework, because apart from number of guiden guidance books developed by the UN, OSCE, and NATO, the crucial institutional framework is actually the Women, Peace, and Security agenda that I would like to talk to uh, now about a little bit. Security Council Resolution 1325 uh, on Women, Peace and Security, uh, which was adopted in 2000, was actually the first resolution of its kind because it linked women to peace and security and it acknowledged that there is actually very different impact on women and girls uh, than uh, on men and boys when it comes to conflicts. Uh, currently, we have eight Security Council resolutions uh, connected to uh, so-called WPS agenda. And these can be divided into two uh, major categories, uh, which also shows us what are we as an international community focusing now on. The first four resolutions um, on women, peace and security actually promote women's active and effective participation in peacemaking and in peace building. The second group, however, which started with the adoption of UNSCR uh, 1820 in 2008, aims to prevent and address conflict-related sexual uh, and gender-based violence. However, despite all these uh, resolutions and number of other initiatives uh, that spurred out of them, participation of women in mediation processes and gender sensitivity of peace uh, agreements has been stagnating, as has been widely discussed uh, two weeks ago during uh, the open debate in UN Security Council. 
Um, in general, however, implementation of women, peace and security agenda would allow for women's meaningful participation in mediation and would also provide for three major um, uh, pluses or three major advantages. First would be the stronger legitimacy and credibility of the peace process because we would include 50% of population that would otherwise be excluded. Uh, second, uh, it would create more comprehensive and targeted proposals for conflict resolutions because women's perspectives can be quite different from the perspective of the fighting men and therefore they can come up with new, uh, with new causes and new consequences of the conflict that might otherwise not have been on the table. Uh, and the third um, would be more durable and sustainable peace because peace agreements uh, with inclusion of women would be more responsive to the specific needs of both women and girls and men and boys for that matter as well. When I was thinking about what should I be talking about today, I have decided rather than just list here uh, different types of activities that UN does in terms of mediation, I will try to actually summarize, though I have to admit rather subjectively, uh, some of the trends in the mediation uh, and gender that I have been witnessing in the UN recently. And while some of these trends are new, some of them have been developing over decades. And uh, I have to say that all of them still have profound implications, not only on the rhetoric in the Security Council and the General Assembly, but also on the actual activities of the UN on the ground, uh, on its functioning, and currently also on the structure of the UN. Uh, let me start by uh, the first trend. Mediation is becoming a very sexy topic. Uh, Secretary General actually put prevention at the forefront of his agenda. Uh, it is thus reflected in the current round of uh, reforms of the organization. In this spirit, uh, SG Guterres uh, has set up Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs and Department of uh, Peace Operations. But we can also see it on a daily basis by different kind of side events that are being organized, uh, by different kinds of funds that are uh, delivered to conflict, uh, conflict zones and conflict countries, but also uh, in the general discussions in the UN about all forms of uh, conflicts and uh, causes for conflicts. Second uh, point would be that gender is all around from disarmament to humanitarian assistance, gender topics are being discussed widely on all UN fora. Concrete topics uh, discussed include, for example, increased recognition that women are actually not uh, a homogeneous group because there are two different uh, aspects that play a big role. First one is that women play very different roles in conflicts. They are not only the peacemakers, they can be fighters, uh, as we saw on some of the pictures from the Lebanese presentation, but uh, they, are also, uh, they are also negotiators. They are setting up peace agreements, they are setting up safe zones, uh, they are mediating uh, release, of, uh, release of people, and all of this is happening on a daily basis from Colombia to uh, South Sudan <laughs> to uh, actually Myanmar. A uh, second point I would like to make here is intersectionality because women are not homogeneous in a sense that there are a lot of different aspects that play a huge part in that. First can be race, it, then it can be religion, it can be uh, ethnicity, it can be socio-economic circumstance of the particular woman and this has to be considered as well. Uh, another topic that is being widely discussed in relating to gender uh, is uh, SGBV or sexual gender-based violence in conflict. Um, it's either connected to the increased use of sanctions, uh, not only standalone sanctions for SGBV, but also um, also in wider considerations. And the second would be children of war, so-called children of war, uh, or children that were born out of uh, sexual and gender-based violence in conflicts. Um, Another trend that I would like to talk to, uh, talk to um, 
talk about here would be informal actors are being recognized. Here, because I know that we don't have much time, uh, I would like to point out to uh, May's presentation because I think she summarized very well what, uh, what an important part these informal actors actually play in conflict. Um, apart from that, uh, I would like to say that there is also a trend towards more comprehensive conflict uh, resolution and pre peace processes that embrace a multitude of stakeholders and issues. Here I'm not talking only about women, I'm talking about youth, I'm talking about the elderly, I'm talking about CSOs um, and various other, uh, other actors. Uh, finally, there is uh, another trend that I would like to mention, which is uh, experts are the key. There is an increased demand, certainly, uh, in the UN for targeted expertise in mediation and its gendered aspects. Um, it's been happening in recent years and it's, it led to an emergence of number of expert bodies. Uh, I can name UN High Level Advisory Board on Mediation, Mediation Support Unit, UN Advisory Board uh, on Mediation. There is, uh, by the way, Secretary General likes to point out here that um, uh, Advisory Board on Mediation has reached gender parity. He's very proud of that. Uh, then we have, for example, UN standby team of senior mediation advisors that can be deployed in uh, zones of crisis. Uh, what I find personally the most interesting though is five women regional mediation networks that were tasked with preventative functions, deployment into conflict zones, as well as actually training and capacity building of young female mediators across the globe. These networks are currently active in, uh, in Nordic area, Mediterranean, Commonwealth, South Africa, as well as in among African Union states under the name Thembais. Despite all the hype, however, the challenges persist. Um, while women are actually increasingly becoming part of the negotiation, they tend to be included only in the formal negotiation phase. Meaning when people are sitting around the table, you might find some women, but you are not going to find women, most likely, uh, in the informal stage of the negotiations before, and you will struggle to find them in the implementation phase. Because as one uh, women CSO leader from South Sudan complained to me uh, a few weeks ago, once the pen which signed the peace treaty was put down, women were, were forgotten. Um, another, another worrying trend that is a challenge for us in, uh, recently is that UN Women warns of increase in sexual and gender-based violence and its use as a weapon of war. Um, however, gender-based violence can actually cause further conflicts in the future. It can rip apart communities, it can create, uh, create uh, circles of violence and um, lead to renewal of the conflict. Another very worrying trend is uh, the, uh, the attacks and, the tar and um, putting a target on the heads of women human rights defenders. Uh, here I can mention Colombia, which has seen a spike in attacks on female uh, human rights defenders, um, but it's also the case in many other countries. And uh, the fact that there is still a big gap between local peace building uh, which, which are some of the things that Maya mentioned, and the representation of women in actual high-level uh, peacemaking. So to conclude, um, I believe that there is definitely a bright future ahead of us uh, in this aspect. However, there is still um, some serious uh, long way to go, and I will leave that to my colleague here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name Thanks for bringing up the issue of, uh, of incorporating women throughout the um, mediation and peace process. Um, and now uh, the floor goes to uh, our last speaker, who is Annette Weber. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, excellencies, the audience, I hope I will be brief, so we will have maybe also potentially a bit of time to exchange views. And I'm very happy and um, glad that the, the speakers speaking before me um, 
already mentioned most of most of the important issues in terms of inclusiveness, in terms of um, the, the gender aspects where women excluded, but then um, mainly targeted during the wars, uh, and also the personal and the, the internal aspects and questions of, of mediation. I will focus much more on a different aspect of, of mediation, that is not the UN, but why is a government like the German government interested in engaging more on mediation, engaging organizations um, to do mediation, but also engaging themselves. So why is mediation as a tool of um, foreign policy of increased interest? Um, Lenka was talking about why it is the case for, for the UN, but I think it's also interesting to look at why that is um, a tool for, for foreign policy for, for a country like Germany. Um, and I would like to make a specific case on the Sudan mediation where the German government is involved because I think it's a, a very um, yeah, unique case and a unique combination of expertise that we have on, on the Sudan mediation. So I would like to go through that specific case, um, but first reconnect to what Lenka said in terms of mediation is a process that is going through all the stages, through the, the conflict, the post-conflict, but also the implementation. Um, and I think this is one of the first challenges for a government um, to see mediation as, as a tool for their diplomacy because normally um, in, as a tool for foreign policy you would like to have results, you would like to have tangible results. This is maybe not the case with mediation because you have to engage long term, you have to engage on various aspects, you have to engage on various levels from track one to track two and um, all that is in between. And that might not lead to a signature uh, under a peace treaty that you can carry home. So I think this is one of the first challenges that, that we can see and why it might be a good idea, but also has to be thought through. Um, I think also the different steps of mediation in terms of when is mediation ripe? When, is a, when are conflict partners ripe to mediate? Um, when do they have an interest actually to have a mediation? When do they have an interest to think about stopping what they're doing and taking a different route? Because it's a long way from an active war um, to, to a peace negotiation. And I think the first recognition has to be that maybe we're not benefiting from this war so much as we could benefit politically, financially, um, and including also social peace, uh, or economically, um, as we could benefit from peace. And I think this is, this is the step that has to happen first. And it's happening maybe at one stage of a mediation, but it can lapse back. So it's not a steady... Um, progress, and I think this is something where mediation always has to come back and ask, are the conflict parties ripe? Are they ready to have a mediation? Are they ready to really go into reflecting that they do want to end the violence, that they do want to end the war? And are they ready to transform? And I think these are two different things that the, that the German government right now understands much more clearly than, than maybe before 2014 that it doesn't mean that having a signature under, um, under a peace treaty doesn't mean that this country or this government is also interested in having a political transformation. I think this is where we're coming to what my, my already said about um, Lebanon. It's not about power sharing necessarily. Um, it might have a very different aspect and interest and agenda for the governments at stake um, why they want to have a peace mediation. I think these are issues that are that are um, important to look at. We, I would like to go to the specific case of Sudan um, out of well, two reasons, because I think, or yeah, out of two reasons, because firstly, I think the, um, the unique combination of what we're doing there, there is the government involvement, the German foreign ministry is actively involved as a facilitator to the African Union. So in terms of multilateralism, which is also something that is in the forefront of German um, foreign policy, multilateralism plays a very important role. Multilateralism not in total, but in specifics, coming from a regional um, actor, the African Union, mediating on Sudan. So this is important because it needs people from the region with an understanding of the region and with an interest in the region, which can also be contradicting to peace, uh, rather than somebody from outside coming and bringing peace. That never worked. Um, and, but I think it's also 
interesting how these how these interlinkages can work and what kind of challenges they bring. The specific case on Sudan is the German government is doing the facilitation with the help of two organizations. One organization that is Berkhoff uh, Foundation with an expertise in mediation and with the facilitators and SWP, which is my organization, the German Inter Institute of, on International and Security Affairs, the biggest think tank in Europe on these issues. Um, where we are providing the expertise on the region, but also the, the expertise on, well, conflict transformation, but also the conflicts themselves. So this combination of having a, a, a well, let's say, a pool of experts from the facilitators, from the African Union, who is basically then at the end doing the peace talks. We're not doing the peace talks. We're facilitating, we're preparing. We're trying to find out, are the, are the parties ripe? Are they interested? How far are they interested? Where do they want to go? What kind of political agenda do they want to um, propose? Where, where are they in their process? Um, and to look back, we started in 2014, to look back and, and look at what worked and what was difficult and where are we at and does mediation work? I would like to give maybe three examples or three steps. Um, I think what did work is the recognition of the parties to the conflict, and I'm talking about the conflict in Darfur, but also the two areas. So the conflict in Darfur, I think you're all familiar with, but the conflict in the two areas is the border between Sudan and South Sudan resulting, or yeah, being a result from the split from, of South Sudan from, from the government of, yeah, in, in Khartoum. Um, but with a part of the South Sudanese liberation movement remaining in the north. So this is a conflict that is not new, but quite um, active right now. So these, these are issues where, um, well, let's say the recognition of the actors on the opposition, the armed opposition and the government side is an achievement because five years ago, the partners or the actors would not recognize themselves as, um, as custodians or as representatives they would call themselves either an illegit illegitimate government or as terrorists. Right now, they do see themselves as actors and as partners in a process. And I think this is a huge step to go from shouting at each other um, to talking to each other. And it's not resulting in uh, you know, a rapid peace deal, but I think it's the first step that people understand that the other side has a right of representation. They do have legitimacy. Um, we might not agree in, in the political part, we might not agree in, in the peace deals, but we do understand that the other side has something to carry and that we have to deal with one way or the other. The other understanding, I think, is, and this is going in, in waves, um, the understanding that economically and that the interest or the benefit from war might not be as big as the benefit that would come if there would be peace. And so, of course, it's also an economic understanding of how much do you have to accept the others to come in, or is it just enough to have to consult with them, or does it also need to lead in, the, in a political transformation? I think these cost um, issues are currently, well, dealt with by, by the government of, of Sudan. Um, but I think these steps are already taken where from both or from all the sides, the understanding that we would benefit more from a peace on the Sudan side, but also from political transformation on the side of the opposition and the armed opposition is an important step. Well, these are different interests um, because one side would like to remain as it is but have less war, that is the government. The other side would like to have a transformation um, and would use war or not war, crisis or not crisis, as a tool um, to engage in this. And I think, again, it's important to talk about the interest rather than just about the adversaries without any, without any solution um, to come. I think these are two steps that are already quite, um, well, quite positive. What is then missing, and you, you were mentioning it, Lenka, Lenk, in, in terms of the next, you know, the, the peace agreement to be signed and the implementation. 
Here, I think it really is important to have all these layers. I talked about them before. And this is where a government like the German government cannot be involved in all these different um, layers. They cannot be involved in the community, for example. And they shouldn't. Um, they should really not play a role. They should maybe finance something. Um, but it cannot be a, an, another government um, getting involved in, in track two as, as such. But I think the coordination between the different tracks is of immense importance, but also the coordination between these different facilitators, because yes, you do have NGOs facilitating, such as Berkov or Center for Humanitarian Dialogue, you have governments, you have um, special envoys, and you have the AU. In many cases, like in South Sudan, for example, you have them facilitating against each other. In Sudan, it's much more of a positive um, role, I think, where because it's clearly understood that the AU is in the lead. The chief negotiator, the, the chief mediator is Tabon Beki. Nobody is questioning this. So you have a quite prominent role, and so everybody else has to coordinate their efforts under this umbrella. And I think this is a very important lesson to be learned, that you should not have um, fractured peace agreements and, and mediation efforts, not only because it doesn't lead to peace, but also because it leads to forum shopping. So for the, for the actors on the ground, it's quite, you know, it's quite nice to have many people approaching you to help you bring your peace, um, and you can start engaging in forums, and of course being a political thinker, as most opposition and governments are, um, you're trying to use the different formats, you use the different forums, if it's the Gulf states, if it's, um, if it's the AU, if it's the EU, you use them to gain, well, different levels of recognition. Um, and that might be a good thing for, for a political process, but it's not very helpful if you really want to get to a point um, where a peace agreement is signed or where at least a session of, of hostilities are signed. So I think in this perspective, the, the case of the Sudan um, is quite a positive case. Again, as I said that before, it's remaining um, a country in conflict and a country in crisis. But the steps so far have been not only positive, but I think they, they, did, the, they did the right work. What is also important to to understand and to go through these processes is to understand that there are interests and that there are interests by all the different actors on the ground, but that there are also interests in the region. And I think, again, talking about South Sudan, the interests of the regional, uh, the, the regional actors are immense. The interests of the neighboring countries are immense. And they're not necessarily the interest in having a stable South Sudan. Um, there, you know, there, there may be more interest by neighboring countries to continue with the war because you're either siding with one side that is currently in power or you um, putting your own troops in there or you siding with somebody else where you want um, them to, to have specific um, positions or territories controlled. I think the interest of the, of the region in the case of Sudan again is more, um, it has more unified interest of having an interest for Sudan to stop the war because the Sudan is right now, after the GCC split in the implementation or the implications it has on, on the Horn of Africa, after the, the, the divide between um, Egypt and, and Ethiopia on the Nile, Sudan is becoming increasingly more in, important for, to play a stable, a stable or a stabilizing role. And it is um, also becoming increasingly important for the Europeans because of their role in the, in the migration process. So interest, um, the, a unified media, or the understanding of interest, a unified mediation, and an informed process, I think, are the key aspects that one should um, take into consideration when engaging in mediation, and specifically when engaging in mediation as, as a government. And, um, Thank you very much for, for listening, and I really hope we might have two or three minutes uh, for a discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I won't take much time uh, for co pulling this together, because I would like to really open the floor for you and your questions. Just one thing that I might like to mention before that is that what was interesting to me throughout listening to our speakers was that 
uh, mediation is a tool that can be used in a very different context. And I'm not only meaning regional context, but also context in terms of the, the, the intensity of the conflict that you're facing, in terms of whether you're facing sort of everyday a social, societal cleavages, or whether you're dealing with armed insurgencies that are prolonged, or whether you're dealing with really a full-blown conflict uh, or post-conflict mediation. And so I guess all these contexts somehow uh, ask for different approaches. And we, of course, our speakers mentioned some of them, but it would be interesting to continue uh, our discussion into that and also maybe into the question how to preempt conflict before it actually uh, occurs in the full intensity. So if there are any questions, um, please go ahead. Yes, please. Thank you. If you could introduce yourself. Thank you. Yes. Uh, good morning. I am the ambassador of Lebanon, and I listened attentively to what Mrs. May had to say. Um, I don't have a question, actually. I just have a few observations. I just wanted to say that in, in understanding the Lebanese situation, one has to look at it from a very holistic point of view. Um, obviously, Lebanon through went a civil war for 15 years, and it's a very painful chapter in our history, which everybody always hopes will never return, and we hope we got past that. However, having said that, once you go through a civil war, obviously the outcome will be you will need some time for reconciliation and confidence building amongst the people. And this is something that the Lebanese government has tried to do through a lot of um, uh, um, the, the actions that it has been taking through trying to include everybody in uh, the, the political life in Lebanon. It, we cannot say it is perfect yet, but the, the government is trying to do that. This is something that is actually um, stated in our constitution, like half the members of parliament are Muslims, half are Christians. They try to include everybody. Um, and when it comes to uh, mediation, um, um, Lebanon has a lot of political ups and downs. They have always resorted to the best means that would probably try to diffuse any political um, um, up, you know, misunderstandings that may arise and lead to um, not very um, wanted circumstances. This has sometimes been translated through um, maybe the army, which is, by the way, a very um, a Lebanese institution that is highly looked up to by many of the Lebanese people and that is inclusive of most of Lebanese segments of society. However, we also try to take into consideration the particular particularities of some of the areas in Lebanon. Sometimes it's better to mediate through the local people than have somebody, as Mrs. Weber said, a government come in and do that in a direct manner. So we try to balance between what is best to, to resolve a situation. Having said that, of course, I believe no government in this world is capable of, of doing miracles all alone. And in that respect, civil society is a very important partner. And nobody can function without civil society. And I think the work that is being done by civil society in Lebanon is very important and highly looked up to. So um, I, I see many of the points of what Mrs. May had to say. And I just wanted to point out that you know, um, Lebanon is a, is a it's a consensual democracy. There's no black and white in Lebanon. But what is being done, we are trying to do the best with what is best available within the government's capacities, capabilities, and on the ground, and taking into consideration the buildup of the society in Lebanon. So I just wanted to make that remark. Thank you. Uh, many thanks. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Professor George Irani, American University of Kuwait. I'll try to be brief, having worked on Lebanon and other places for several years. Uh, May, thank you. Good, good talk, uh, presentation. Uh, fundamentally speaking, Lebanon is not a nation state. It's a mosaic of sects, of groups, number one. Number two, uh, confessionalism is not power sharing, because keep in mind that the power sharing in Lebanon was based on the 1932 population census, and since then we never had a census in Lebanon, because today the Muslim community is a majority, or relative majority, 
Number three, we never had a process of policing the past that was done in Chile, Argentina, in this part of the world, the lustrations in Czech Republic, in Poland, uh, and in African South Africa with the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions. This is why in Lebanon today we have no reconciliation, we have no government, we have corruption all over the place, and we have 17,000 Lebanese that have disappeared during the war, civil war, until today we don't know where the fate is. And then the afternoon I will pursue on that. Thank you. The other thing to my sister from uh, Germany regarding uh, uh, mediation. Okay, in Africa, we have the disaster in Congo, which is going on. Where is the EU in that? Where is the United Nations? Where are the Europeans? Rwanda is an interesting model. No one is talking about the indigenous model of reconciliation, which is a major part of my work and other colleagues in Canada and other places. Uh, issue of Sudan, don't forget, South Sudan is a disaster. They're killing each other. They're fighting each other, the leaders, the leaders. They're fighting each other in... in, uh, in uh, and then, of course, let's not forget the infamous Omar al-Bashir, who is also was indicted by the ICC and so on and so forth. Sorry for being a fly in the ointment, but as an academic, I need to talk a bit of the truth. Merci. Yes, please, thank you. Yes, it's just a remark. It's not really a question, but it can be. Uh, I, uh, my best friends are from Yemen, and also I have colleagues from there. And uh, when I speak with my friends from Yemen, um, I really trust, I'm Christian, I really trust the power of um, Islamic uh, courts locally. Um, the father of one of my friends is a judge. It's something totally external from state, but it really works very, very well. It's very powerful to solve local conflicts. So uh, when I talk about Yemen with my friends and I see the news, it's not the same country. So I would just like to ask May if she can think about this very local uh, initiative, whichever Christian or Muslim, it's not the point. I think we can take the best from all these churches. So do you find something also improving for, for the whole uh, communities? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to ask you if you want to comment on any of the questions and at the same time, and keep it brief because we're sort of running out of time. And at the same time, if you think about something important that you'd like to say about the question how to best uh, preempt conflict, uh, what is your personal experience uh, with the debt question? So that's, that's to that. And yeah, I don't know in what order you want to. Ready? Okay. Um, thank you very much. Well, pre prevention, I think I'm maybe not the best person to, to talk about. But in, in terms of the response to, to Professor Irani, um, I was focusing on Sudan, so Gachacha and, and DRC, you know, we can fill days with um, failed attempts or no attempts um, or the difficulty to have. Um, let's say a bottom-up approach used by a government um, to keep a specific situation or a specific balance and I think they're, they're very critical points um, that, that we could dis discuss. Um, you mentioned Omar al-Bashir, of course, I mean this is exactly, but this exactly is the question. When do you start engaging in mediation? Do you start engaging in mediation if your um, actors on the ground are peaceful, political, nice people? No. I mean, this is not where you need to engage in mediation. You need to engage in mediation where it's really, as where the source of conflict is so deep um, that it's not just a conflict that is battled on in the parliament, but is basically this, the essence of the state. And if you look into the history of Sudan, you know, it's, not, it's no surprise that 2011 South Sudan separated. The essence of Sudan is that the center always had violent conflict with the periphery. But what does that mean? That because that's the case, that there shouldn't be an engagement because 
that's a political DNA, I think this is exactly the point where the engagement should start. And I would fully agree, the engagement cannot just be on one level and we cannot just trust the government to be interested in having a transformation, but by having all these different levels where you have the, the local, where you have um, civil society, where you have the, the political opposition engaging in formulating um, a political agenda, I think this is exactly the way how a transformation could be foreseen. Thank you. Well, thank you, Your Excellency, for your intervention. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Irani. Um, as for the question on, on uh, religious groups doing their own mediation on the ground, which is, I think, what you were asking, if there are some local. Well, um, it really depends on who they are mediating for. Are they mediating between their own communities and the government or between different groups within a competitive space where they want to exert power and influence? So there are several variables, but I mean, Islamist groups are not things that exist in bubbles. There is a huge social, religious community that comes with this, and it's not only a religious, you know, group that, I mean, it's something that really is part and parcel of a fabric of a certain society. When you talk about Islamist groups, you're, you're not talking about the certain individuals and leaderships, but you're also talking about how they serve their communities. So um, I'm, I'm, sh I'm quite unsure of where, what you really meant by your question. Sorry. Because it's the, the um, so when you go uh, on Yemen, so in Yemen you have uh, two, two different judicial systems. Sorry, from, I'm French, I'm, I'm not English speaker. So, uh, so you have a first level, would I, would I say, but it's not pyramidal. You have the first level, which is really local. And this is uh, like um, what I would call Islamic courts. I'm, I'm not sure it's really the, the official. And to the judges, they are taken from the best individual. I mean, the, 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 there is a consensual uh, designation of who will be the judges in the local courts. This so-called Islamic court. And then you have another level, which is state organized judicial system. But it's like, as I can see them, it's not, they, they cope, I mean, they are very complementary. And what I say is, I, I'm Christian, but I, I would trust uh, the decisions of the local court, even if they are mostly Muslim, yes, because uh, Yemen is a Sunni country. And it's, 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 it's the solution. What do you think about that? Well, yes, of course. <laughs> um, I mean, definitely. I mean, we, I do not want to open the whole concept of like judicial systems, but for us it's also the, also the sectarian nature of what I was mentioning is also kind of translated into our judicial system. What is actually interesting in Lebanon is that Dar al-Fatwa, which is a Sunni institution for the Sunnis in Lebanon, is actually a governmental institution compared to all others that are, that are not. They're actually their own religious institutions. So there's also this kind of dialogue and closeness to the government um, by this specific institution, which is really interesting. And it's also being used, they're also being used in the process of mediation and, and peace building by actually pro projects that have also been discussed here. So um, definitely <laughs> need to diversify in different religious actors, of course, and also everyone has a say in Lebanon. Okay. Thank you. And my, if you allow me, uh, important point, uh, the role played by Hezbollah and its judicial system. I don't know if you know, in the Beka, for instance, they have their own system. My colleague, Dr. Dizar Habzi, wrote a whole chapter about that, how basically they are using their own judicial system to try to enforce law outside the state's law. Right? That's why they call Lebanon today Dwaylat Hezbollah, Lebanon, uh, Hezbollah statelet, which is true. That's a very important reality. Plus, you have all the roles of the Muslim and the Musalahas. I want to talk about it this afternoon. So that's very important to keep in mind. Last but not least, it seems to me there's some kind of a post-colonial trend here, that we Westerners have the uh, pizza, have the solution for you folks, you know, terrible people in, in the third world, in Africa, Middle East, and other places, and we come and give it to you. Really, folks? How about uh, Hungary? How about Poland? How about Italy? How about United States of America, Trump building walls to keep the, the, the foreigners out? So this totally contradicts the message of this conference, reaching out to the others. 
it is kicking out the other folks. This is what we need to talk about. I'm sorry to be a pest, but that's very important to talk about. Thank you. Merci. Uh, thank you for bringing up the point. I hope there will be some space at the conference to discuss that. Uh, I would, unless Mai wants to say something very, very quick, or Lenka. Okay, so keep it very quick, and then we need to dissolve. I would like to uh, say one final point from my side, and I think mediation is foremost about respect. Respect to all parties, and what I was trying to also say is, in my, in my opinion, if we are trying to negotiate complex agreements, we also need to include everybody. Therefore, uh, I really very much appreciate uh, all our panelists and everything that they have been saying, as well as uh, as um, our interventionists um, and people uh, and the professor and uh, Madam Ambassador here. Um, and I would like to stick to, the, stick to the main message, at least for me. Uh, the mediation is about respect and about inclusiveness. And I think that's a way forward. Thank you very much, uh, everybody. And uh, now it's time for a very quick coffee break. Thank you.